Hello and uh, welcome to the RSS Built Environment Forum webinar series. Today's session is in partnership with HKA. Um, Danielle, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, I'd like to just to take this opportunity, if I may, to thank ASITE, our lead technical partner, uh, just to begin with. Uh, my name is Martin Burns. I'm head of ADR research and development at RSCS. Uh, today's session is going to be subject matter is operating in uncertain times and how can the construction industry adapt to a new normal. Um, over the next hour, I and four leading uh, experts in the field will be discussing uh, this subject matter operating in uncertain times and how the construction industry can adapt to the new normal. Uh, First of all, I'd like to um, use this opportunity to uh, give you a little oversight to um, HKA's Cook's report. Um, if we could just move through the next slide, Danielle. Um, th this report draws on HKA's uh, unprecedented um, knowledge to provide valuable insights into the most common causes of claims and disputes in the construction and engineering sector. And um, it's, um, as you can see um, from some of the slides I'm going to whip through here, some of the headline facts and figures show the astounding scale of cash and time lost on construction and engine, engineering projects around the globe. And um, I think the preamble to this session is that these uh, statistics are eye-watering and in fact it's extraordinary. Uh, that this year's Crooks report has shown uh, how uh, in 1,400 projects across 94 countries that there have been an immense amount of overruns and um, capital values of three quarters of scheduled programs being uh, wasted. I'm not going to uh, go through these slides in any great detail and if you download the webinar uh, after this is completed, you will see there's some nice comprehensive notes which cover these slides in more detail than I'm able to give in the short time we've got available here. But um, what I'd like you to do is to download the uh, webinar after this, have a look at the notes, but of course, for much more detail, you really uh, should download the HKA Crooks report itself and see the immense amount of granular detail that that also provides. Um, as I say, just whip through these slides. The, this uh, uh, report has um, identified the, sort of the key areas where disputes arise. And this is not just uh, endemic to one particular uh, region. This is happening globally. And uh, of course, COVID-19 is a global pandemic, but uh, the issues around shortages of materials, uh, inconsistent adoption of technology and a failure by some um, businesses to adapt quickly to technology, uh, political drivers to get uh, construction projects finished quicker than normal, uh, sustainability and climate concern, of course we've just had the COP26 um, uh, 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 conference, all of these issues of course are underpinning the problems that are arising in the construction engineering uh, sector and driving different forces to create disputes and conflicts. Danielle? You know, we, we're living in uncertain times. Everybody knows that right across the globe. Um, and COVID-19, for example, directly impacts on the, um, the industry, creating a shortage of movement of people, uh, the shortages of skills, raw materials, um, as I say, political drivers. Um, greater detail, of course, is available if you do download the report. What I'd like to do now is uh, introduce you, if I may, to uh, the panel of people who are going to be talking today. Uh, Helen Colley is a technical director at HKA. Uh, Laura Lintot is a senior associate at Charles and Hamlin's uh, legal firm. Um, Justin Sullivan, who I've known for, for many years as Chair of Construction Industry Council, and Charles Wilsoncroft as a partner at HKA. And it's Charles I want to talk to first because we have a number of questions which 
I think will help to create a discussion around how we adopt to the new um, to the new world that's uh, arising. And, and Charles, I'd like you, if you may, just to, to give us 30 seconds or a minute or just to ex tell us who you are, and then perhaps we, you and I can have a discussion around um, the, uh, the, sev the severity of COVID-19 and the impact it's had on the, on this, on the engineering sector. Sure, thank you, Martin, uh, and good morning, good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, my name is Charles Wilson Croft, as Martin mentioned, I'm a partner at HKA. Uh, I've been with uh, HKA in the pre business for, for nearly 12, 13 years now. Uh, I'm a civil engineer by trade, um, and I am involved in and generally get involved in all aspects of the project life cycle for construction work. So, from the advisory stage, uh, pre contracts, and non contentious work through uh, assisting with developing and assessing claims and then providing expert witness uh, support uh, when and if things do go down the, the formal dispute resolution path. Um, I do a lot of work both in the UK and also internationally. I have a significant international focus, so uh, I have a, quite a, a reasonable feel of, of the, the wider impact of COVID um, in both regions and, and nationally. And I think the question about the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic is, is quite quite a, a, a crucial starting point. Uh, you know, I think it's it's fair to say that certainly pretty much every construction project that I've been involved in or been aware of uh, over the over the last couple of years has been impacted by the effects of COVID, and I say most of them have been impacted to quite a quite a significant degree. Um, now, it's worth bearing in mind that. You know, some parties have actually had some positive impacts from COVID. You know, some companies have been able to use uh, use the the issues that are arising globally to reinforce their positions. Um, but in respect of the delivery of projects, uh, generally there has been negative impact across the board, and that that has been due to to a, a, a wide range of reasons. Um, we all saw in the earlier stages that the supply chains were being uh, impacted quite a lot. A lot of material and equipment coming out of China, um, certainly in Europe in the early stages, a lot of equipment coming through and being manufactured in, in Italy was being severely impacted. Um, supply chains do seem to have uh, uh, bounced back from that somewhat. However, we are still seeing a hangover. There are still issues in respect of um, certain components. Um, you know, we're all aware of the, uh, the, the global microchip um uh, the microchip uh, uh drought as it were which is then impacting the the fabrication or, or, or of equipment and plants and construction plants on site so you know, companies like jcb and cat are having big impacts which is then slowing down the ability to get that that equipment uh into into the uh, into the workforce on a worldwide scale obviously from a delivery point of view on projects movement of labor has been a key issue um, and this is this is probably more prevalent in, in international projects where you have large labor forces who are moving from one country to another um, you know a migratory workforce who come in and, and do a significant bit of work i do a lot of work in the offshore environment as well and, and those projects have also been significantly hampered with different countries different regions around the world having different restrictions restrictions on vessel movements restrictions on crew changes um, uh, and the inability to have that kind of consistent cycle that, that, that these contractors utilize. So there really has been a very, very broad uh, impact from a national level. Different countries have had, had different varying degrees of uh, internal restrictions in respect of working practices, in respect of requirement to isolate, in respect of people having to quarantine or being offered illness. So there really is myriad issues that have impacted COVID um, to, to really quite a significant degree. It's also worth sure. mentioning there have been impacts in the design stage as well in some places. Now, you know, some projects, some companies have obviously moved to remote working, which has added a lot of flexibility and, and ability to, to bend and flex with, with, with issues as they arise. But again, some uh, companies were uh, had significant issues where they had the majority of the workforce or very large numbers of workforce being off. So therefore, the the, the early stage contract, the, the feed uh, stages, the design development stages 
took quite a significant hit in those early stages of, of, of COVID, as, COVID as well. Um, Charles, I, can, can, I, can I just ask a, a quick question? I'm sorry to interrupt you. But, um, please. Well, one of the things that I was very keen to hear is very much about whether you think the, the impact in, of COVID in terms of the severity is a short, medium or long-term thing. Well, I think uh, I think ultimately you have you had the the initial short term delay impact, um, which which was very very keenly felt and 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 really unavoidable uh, and, and and very noticeable that impacted projects straight away. So a very severe impact in respect of you know either a shutdown or a specific delay to a project, which ultimately will have a uh, an immediate run out. Then you run into the medium term, which is the kind of ongoing disruptive effects, which we're still seeing now. You know, so projects generally aren't shut now. However, as we all know, we're still in COVID, for us so, um, and and she's coming around again for a, for another another bite, as it were, um, with the new variants. And you know, certainly in Western Europe, we're starting to see tighter restrictions. And globally, you know, some com some countries have still got very strict restrictions. And I think we're going to continue to see this this ebb and flow. So this this kind of, kind of current medium term ongoing disruptive elements is going to end up being is is going to end up having a long term impact. That's not even interplaying with the very long term impact, which is the general hangover of the sector to try and get back up to speed to for all the ground that we've lost. So I think it really is a short kind of that media image issue in respect of well the site can't work now medium disruptive impacts which is ongoing which is going to end up in a long-term hangover which you know is going to be a difficult you know similar to the 2007 financial crash you know it takes a long time for the industry to, to make back up that gap um, and fill that fill that kind of that void that has arisen over the last two years now and, and everything you've said there kind of underpins the sort of theme of this uh, webinar today which is about uncertainty uh, and what does that tell us about the challenges for project managers now and going forward? Well, project managers have to, you know, they, they've very much had to change the way they look at things. I mean, uh, we, we were discussing just before we came on, weren't we, about this idea of kind of collaborative approach and, and what have you. But it, it's almost a bit more basic than that. You know, it used to be the way that you could enter into a project and you'd have a, you know, obviously we'd have a reasonable handle on the impacts that you know the risks that would arise on that and experienced project managers and project management companies and employers and contractors going into projects would have a reasonable good reasonably good handle on well what are the risks that are going to apply to this well it seems like covid has almost kind of rewritten the rule book when it comes to understanding risk um, and the impact of risk you know because as we said we're now getting a handle on what it has meant to be involved with COVID and what it is what it means to to be able to to work with and deal with it going forwards, we still can't see a, a complete way out. We're still going to have to come up with ways to 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 work around that. But I think that there's actually some value and benefit of that. You know, there, there is obviously there's, there's a lot of tragedy. There's a lot of human tragedy that's come out of this process. But I think we will look back in 10, 15, 20 years time and think, well, actually, there are a lot of positive um, movements that have been made or developments that have been made in effective project management to build into project delivery structures the ability to flex, to bend, to be able to look for a little bit more insight, spot issues as they arise and have a workforce, have a resilient supply chain and have contractors who are able to move, like I said, bend and flex with, with the, you know, the weft and the weave of things as they may arise. So it might be that COVID itself ceases to be an issue in the future, but then something else that may come along, well, we've got a more resilient project management structure um, an industry set up around that to be able to move a little bit more with the, the moving times. Everything you say there, Charles, resonates with me, and it resonates with a conference I attended just a couple of weeks ago where you know, I heard uh, it said that the world has changed, it's still changing, and it's never going to go back to the way it was. And some yeah. of that is is a positive thing, uh, which is effectively what you're saying. We might be scratching our heads now, and project managers might be scratching their heads, but going forward, there's uh, there's some positive positivity that can be drawn from what's happening as a result of all of this. That seems to be key. Yeah, I I think you're absolutely right, and and this I think just the the, the mindset of 
of having to be more um, adaptable. You know, it's this idea of adaptability. You know, so whereas you know we, we've realised for for several years now that companies need to be adaptable. You know, if you're too rigid as a company, then you, you're going to risk being left behind. But I think we need to apply that kind of mentality to project delivery stage because I think the project delivery stage at the moment is still a little bit rigid. This is how we deliver it and this is what we do. Well, we need to get that mindset of, of being adaptable, being flexible, being, being able to be reactive and apply that better to a project. Because very often contracts aren't able to be easily reactive and flexible because they, they, are, they, they set a box, you know, they set a parameter, you know, the contractors to do this in a certain amount of time in a certain way. Obviously you can have more flexible contracting models but there's a payoff with that in respect to where the risk sits, where the, you know, you know, the flexibility of the employer, all the rest of it. We can, you know, talk about this all day. But I think this idea of having more flexible models generally is probably going to result in a more resilient industry in the future. Yeah, and everything that you say is being driven by the, the COVID. You know, there's all these changes, all this uh, move to more flexibility, and, and thinking about how projects should be delivered. So. To that extent, then, is the impact of COVID-19 unique in your experience? Um, I, I think as, as, as it, on, it, on its own merits, yes, it is unique. And, and obviously, there's been lots of people talking about this and lots of people talking about the fact that it's unprecedented and obviously, you know, people using force majeure clauses, left, right, centre and all the rest of it. Um, and I think genuinely it is different, certainly in, in living memory, you know, I'm 43 and I can't think of anything that, that is, is generally like it. Now we have obviously had large global scale issues that have impacted the construction sector in the past. So as I mentioned before, you know, the 2007 uh, uh, financial crash was a global issue. It did impact a lot of projects, but in a slightly different way. You know, that was more focused on because because of uh, you know national backing. You know, infrastructure projects weren't necessarily impacted so much. With more private sector development, you know, residential side of things, those projects seemed to be hit a bit more. And it was hit in a different way. It was more a case that those kind of projects were either mothballed or scrapped or stopped, and, and there were lots of empty building sites around as, as we all remember um, you know and funders just said well actually now I'm going to stop investing for the time being now that's a very so although that impacted globally um, and it certainly impacted construction very very significantly it wasn't it didn't permeate into everyone's lives it didn't permeate into into every aspect of everything that people did as much as Covid did um, and it didn't have that kind of ongoing disruptive effect it had a more of a and it was obviously very very damaging but it was more a case of right everything's stopping and then everything's going to restart again slowly picked up start again whereas this is more just an ongoing cultural impact and, and as you mentioned i think you know this is the 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 the, the disruptive effects are going to continue with covid for for a, a significant period yet um and so that's that's the thing about it as well it's a very difficult thing to actually put your finger on and define what it is compared to the 2007 crash, which was much more um, distinct. It's much more kind of definable, I think. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. There have been things in recent memory and indeed distant memories, which had significant impact on construction projects. But certainly in our, our living memory, and I'm, I'm slightly older than you, Charles, I'm not going to say how old, but uh, uh, in my memory as well there hasn't been anything that's been as unique as COVID-19 in terms of its short medium and long-term impact and as, as far as the long-term impact goes we, we're still not sure where it's going to go and how long it's going to last. No. Um, I'd like to move on and thank you very much Charles and please do contribute if you feel you, you'd like to to uh, the conversations we'll uh, engage in now. Um, I want to move on to if I may to, to Justin. Uh, before I do uh, those who are listening, can you please um, take advantage of the uh, facility to ask questions as well? And we'll try and pick those up. Any questions that we, we don't have time to deal with here that you may want to put to this panel, um, we will endeavour to follow up afterwards. So please do. Um, Justin, before uh, you introduce yourself, um, uh, the subject matter of your particular question about frequency of disputes. I, I was talking to um, some government officials pretty early on in the lockdown and their concern was that 
the, uh, the COVID-19 and the, the, the new environment we're all living in was actually going to be the cause of a tsunami of disputes in the future. And it'd be interesting to get your kind of feel on, you know, compared to before the pandemic, where we are now and what we might be seeing in the future about the frequency and nature of disputes. Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks, Martin. It's good to see you and uh, well, welcome, everybody. Um, so, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a quantum expert. I'm a quantity surveyor, a fellow of RICS and of the Expert Witness Institute. And my practice is called ADARE. And I practice mainly in the UK. I have done overseas work, but it's mainly it's mainly UK based. based. I've, I've held roles at RICS. I've been on Governing Council. I, I was Global Chair for QS Construction for a number of years. And I'm my current um, post for outward giving to construction is the I chair the Construction Industry Council. So I've, I also chaired a, a coalition called um, ICMS, um, which I, I will talk a little bit about as well. So um, Martin, if you, I mean, you're an RICS guy, and I'm going to ask you a question. So when we go into a session, what happens to the amount of appointments of adjudicators and arbitrators? Good question. Um, just historically, and I've been working for RSS, we believe, for over 30 years. So I've seen trends and I've seen recessionary impacts on dispute resolution. And what tends to happen is the head of a, a kind of uh, an impact on the economy is adjudication numbers will start to rise and rise very quickly. Yeah. Um, we know that because RICS appoints adjudicators and we probably appoint more adjudicators than other organisations. Um, and we see as we move into a recessionary uh, situation, uh, a, 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 you know, a peak of um, adjudication numbers. And then as the recession really hits, they drop off a cliff and start yeah, so to I've, really... I've, I, that's why I asked the question. I knew the answer to that question. And I, okay. I've been asking Simon Rubinson, RICS, when he, do, when he does his graphs, he loves a graph, Simon, and he tracks what's happening with our economy, that he puts your stats on that graph. Because it's okay. a really good indication of where we are in that curve of a recession. And I, he hasn't done it yet, but now this is going to be recorded, so I'm going to play it back. So what, so a tsunami of, of disputes, for sure. Okay, so um, we're really busy. My dispute team is the busiest team in my business. Um, are they COVID-related disputes? No, they're not. They're not pandemic related. I think what happens is it's it's recession, yeah, that we went into. It was a it was a shock. And what people do when they're sitting there in lockdown at home, they look at their balance sheet and they go after money. I think that's what they do. I think things have been rumbling along and they think, well, I'm approaching the limitation period. I'm gonna go after it. So we've seen lots and lots and lots of disputes, lots and lots of claims. We're seeing much more litigation than adjudication now and arbitration. I think that litigation, because there's more certainty with it, you're not paying the dispute resolver. Often on the chunky stuff, it goes to adjudication and then it goes to litigation because one party or maybe both, maybe it was more than one party, hey, I've got one where there's six and they don't, they don't agree with it. But what, what I've seen, Martin, what, and with my other industry roles on, is I've seen of the Adair's projects, because we have a project team as well, is that we've not had disputes there. We've probably got 100 jobs running any any one time. They all came to a solution during lockdown. Suspension on sites for some of them, uh, they all came to a solution. There was one that hadn't settled, and I believe and I hope it's just recently settled. And I think the reason they've done that is because the client, the client was worried because the market changed, the market dropped, okay? The banks are then worried because construction costs are gonna go up, even if it is force majeure, and even if the contractor is not entitled to any loss in expense or the client can't deduct damages, the, the finances around the project have changed. Now that could lead to contractors' balance sheets being worrying, bonds being called on. So they settled. So um, refunded, refinanced, and re reset the project. The other thing that we're seeing, and I wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't on my radar, is we're seeing, particularly in the UK, and I imagine overseas, we're seeing a lot of claims on professional indemnity insurance. So that is where the contractor might have gone bust, and the only place the client can go, the funder can go, can get money is from people who are insured, and inevitably that's the consultants. So they're going to, they're claiming against people's insurance, 
that has led to huge hikes in insurance premiums but it's also led to a problem where when you're in the dispute and you're in the mediation and you're trying to settle the person you're claiming against although they have insurance they might not have cover okay so we're seeing a lot of coverage issues where insurers aren't covering people or reducing cover now the effect that has it might be that someone carries 10 million insurance for example but they've got so many claims against them that it goes over their limit in which case they're calling on balance sheets and outside of the insurance um, provision so um, yes we are seeing more disputes we've seen different types of disputes yes around the cladding and the fire safety issue mm. which is it's not just a uk problem i know because i know people in ireland and middle east are suffering from this as well and because the market is changing and so the, the drivers that that clients have and contractors have is making is making life difficult but the solution to it martin and i do have that is the spice girls and that's a uk pop group and they had great success when they were all together it's one of the most successful female bands ever but when they split up and did their solo careers they were a disaster and it just just shows how collaboration can work and i i use the spice girls a lot as an example and we're seeing that in our sector so we're seeing um, the construction leadership council as an example of that the construction industry council and the icms coalition we launched icms3 yesterday i have to get that plug in which is um, it's all about data and data costing and all of those three things are examples of how our sector which is traditionally very fragmented with co with collaboration is coming together and it's getting better so i'd like to see and charles mentioned it our forms of contract are very adversarial they, they, they cause disputes if you want to get into a court in the uk you've got a two-year wait i think to get into the tcc and that's a product of having an adversarial forms of contract and legal system which if we could work more flexibly in the future maybe that will be better so that that a very long answer to not one of your questions but does that help yeah just in, i've never heard the spice girls analogy before and i think um i'm not going to forget it so that means it's worked <laughs> well done there look you, you asked me a question a moment or two ago you asked me a question about my experience of what happens as we enter into a recessionary period and i said that adjudication numbers take a, a big hike and then they drop off the cliff well let me tell you that uh, when lockdown occurred in march 2020 adjudication numbers did take a big hike a uh, 50% increase month on month wow. the thing is they didn't fall off a cliff afterwards right. they they dropped back down a little they dropped back down to just above pre covid um, uh, levels but in the last 2 3 months we've started to see it start to rise again I tell you what we've also seen is um, more and more SMEs taking advantage of adjudication. You know, businesses that we'd never seen before and businesses, SMEs that are using adjudication more than once. Um, they, this is telling us a, a different story, one we haven't seen before. Um, but it's also telling us that the construction industry is remains rife with disputes. And I, I, I'd be interested in getting your view on why is the construction industry so prone to disputes? I, th I think, okay, I mean, one is the adversarial contracts, okay? I mean, the, the other is, I mean, um, I'm going to talk about the UK again, and I apologise because we've got people from all over the world on this call, that our tier one contractors work on margins of between one and four percent. That's what they work on. So they win the job, and the next thing they do is they hammer their supply chain to try and get the price down, to try and improve their margins. And then they open up their book and they, they look at the consultants that have been novated over and claiming from the client. And it just leads to it leads to um, disputes. That's a rather cynical view. I'm a quantum expert, so I see I see a lot of disputes. But I it, it does it does trouble me that we have an industry that does that. Um, I'd be interested in Charles, is that would you share that view? Is it a product of a, a very low margin industry? yeah absolutely I, I i completely agree with you um you know and, and this thing that, going back to the question before people are obviously focused on covid but you know you can't forget that we have significant issues and we will continue to have significant issues likely um pre and post uh, the effects of covid for exactly that reason you know just look at 
the example of Carillion as a, a headline example, but that's not an isolated uh, example, and it's all related to this 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 story. Um, uh, so absolutely, yeah, hundred percent agree with you that, that there's issue with the whole supplying uh, supply chain structure in that respect, and the mentality that that parties go into. Um, so the question is, what is the solution, Justin? Yeah. Collaboration. We need, to, we need to be, you mentioned it, we need to be more flexible in our forms of contract and our approach to client needs to be as well. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to think that as a sector, we're the biggest industry, you know, we're globally, we're 13% of GDP in construction and we, we need to sort ourselves out really. You, you say collaboration, uh, Justin, I, I think it, it's, it is that, it's more than that, because collaboration needs a culture change. You know, to, to move away from historical, combative, adversarial uh, nature. And uh, before this uh, session today, we had the uh, the luxury of having a conversation around the UK government's promotion of conflict avoidance and early intervention, and encouraging parties through guidance and through uh, policy notes to try and work to uh, resolve disputes before they even you know, turn into disputes, if you like, to, to work cl more closely together, to think about their contracts and think about the risk uh, of disputes right at the very beginning and early, but rather than wait till a dispute has happened. Um, and, you know, drawing on, on what Justin has been saying, Charles, uh, you know, and what you've also been talking about in terms of the way the, uh, the industry has changed and how it's going to change in the future, do you think that parties are either becoming more trigger happy now or do you think they are more prepared to resolve issues amicably and work together to try and deal with problems? Um, well I think that there has been what, what we saw certainly at the at the early stages um, of the the current pandemic was a lot of conversation, a lot of goodwill, a lot of uh, very positive um, talk about support, um, about the fact that you know, no, no, you know, people are going to work together. That people understand that this is something that, that impacts everyone, and and it was really noticeable. Actually, it was it was very noticeable in, in my mind. So, although yes, you're right, and and I did see, and we did see a significant jump in in applications. We still saw this conversation, this general conversation, saying, well, look, you know, we're we're, we're talking with the supply chain, and things are, things are working. But I think that lasted um for to a to a degree to a point and then um i think my feeling is that what happened is that though those kind of general positions of of kind of goodwill and intent got a bit stretched um and frankly people realized that because ultimately it's a case of how the flow of money is going to go um and if there is no flow of money coming down from the then it's not going to necessarily pass down to the bottom and then then you get to this point where you do still have uh you know disputes being um you know as you say you know people are becoming a, a little bit more trigger happy and people and what i think it, it's fair to say we're seeing now is now those kind of conversations have have got to a point people realize that actually yeah but maybe there's not the cash coming down so now there are a, a greater number of claims and I, it will be interesting to um, take people's views on the the average. How to put this? The 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 um, the, the quality of the packages that are being put together in respect of um, trying to uh, make sure you know people people are looking to try and get avenues to get money through the supply chain. Mm. Uh, what we're seeing at the moment is people are being a bit more creative maybe in how they present claims that they might not otherwise have presented because they think oh you know come, coming back to Justin's point you mentioned about force majeure well as you know it depends contractually of course but very often force majeure won't give an entitlement to costs and that's really where a lot of people are being hit in the pocket so now well, how can we come up with something that gives us some recovery of cost for what's happening? We might not otherwise be able to get that. Charles, thank you very much for that real-world experience and, and 
uh, what you say there. I'm going to move quickly on to, to Laura. Laura's sitting there patiently. Laura, um, would you like to introduce yourself and um, let's have a conversation. Yeah, yeah let's do that. Um, so hi everyone, I'm a senior associate at Strauss and Hemlins. I'm a contentious construction solicitor advocate and I do both, um, well, both a number of uh, types of disputes, so international, or all related to construction, international arbitration, litigation, adjudication, mediation, and uh, expert determination, and of course, risk prevention and advisory work. So that's in a nutshell. And your question, Laura, is very much about whether the um, pandemic has increased or reduced willingness of parties to, to actually approach conflicts in a less adversarial way. What's your experience? Well, um, I think when when the pandemic started and the lockdown started, there maybe there was a tendency to, or there was a more more of a willingness to compromise. And because it was so unprecedented what happened with the pandemic, um, I think parties and companies were more willing to delay uh, entering into disputes to see first how the pandemic is going to be addressed. However, I think now it's back to normal and if anything we've seen and like you said before there was an increase in um, adjudication uh, domestically before going to litigation. Adjudication as we all know is commercially more viable for the parties and particularly I would say more um, accessible for, for smaller construction companies. I mean 80% of the construction industry consists of smaller uh, construction companies and then Internationally, of course, internationally, international arbitration is hugely uh, popular in construction. I would dare to say more so than litigation in my personal experience. So rather than the current situation lead people to start thinking of working more collaboratively, working to try and deal with issues less adversarially, what you're suggesting is that as the COVID situation arose, people were effectively banking disputes. That's a really interesting way of um, putting it. I think looking at it from another perspective, if you have a large company, um, then they, oh, and also if you have an upturn or downturn in, in, in economy, you can have an increase, potential increase in disputes, either because companies have the money to actually uh, carry the burden of the fees entering into disputes, or simply on the other side, on the other hand, because they are counting each and every penny and they are desperate to actually get everything that they, they feel belongs to them and so they will enter a dispute more readily. And parties, when they're thinking about using adversarial procedures like litigation and arbitration, um, are they thinking about the, the costs and the time that it takes to, to get through a dispute using those procedures? They are, and, and this is also our role as legal advisors to always, always give them the information what their options are. So, of course, both litigation and international arbitration especially can be quite expensive. They have their benefits. I think some, I think you or somebody else said earlier, litigation gives you certain certainty, and with international arbitration it gives you that sort of complex, compact solution mechanism for parties from different countries. Um, but we do always advise, look, you may want to settle first or you can really settle at any stage of a dispute. So we always tell the parties, even if you enter into a formal dispute resolution process, nothing is stopping you to end it and try to, and first to try and discuss it with the other party, settle and end the uh, formal dispute resolution process. And as a firm, are, are you encouraging parties to deal with disputes much earlier? or? Are, are you coming at the point where they've become entrenched, they now need legal advice to take a dispute through arbitration or the litigation process? You mean when, when are we approached by the client as in at what stage of the dispute? That, that's a better way of phrasing the question I've just asked. Yes, I agree. Yeah. No, no, thank you. So I, I would say always seek legal advice early and if it's, you know, if you do, it can be any lawyer, I just say in general, because it can avoid a lot of pitfalls. If you if you get that legal advice early, that actually can mitigate the likelihood of having to go through a full-blown dispute process. Right. And do, do you as a firm have any sort of real life experiences of disputes being um, avoided in, in terms of not going to litigation, not going to arbitration, but parties actually working to try and resolve them between themselves, either through a mediative process or through some sort of conflict avoidance mechanism. 
Absolutely, mediation is extremely popular and it's something that you can use on its own or like I said before, you can actually interrupt and suspend uh, you know, legal proceedings and enter mediation because it, it's not very long. And the advantage of course of that is that even if the parties are highly emotionally embroiled in something and don't really, are not able to face each other directly, mediation gives that breathing space, you know, separate rooms, uh, mediator and other party who's neutral to actually resolve the disputes and yes parties to like to mediate and, and it's a very cost efficient as well. And how amenable or otherwise are the parties that you're dealing with to suggestions to use mediation rather than go down the litigation route for example? They will all, always consider mediation but of course the parties will be under different pressures if we if we act for, for government bodies or, or large companies or smaller companies they, they can have different agendas they will have to have certain financial targets to meet um etc but mediation or alternative dispute resolution will always be discussed and considered by both by by all parties do you see any differences in in, in regions you know is there a regional um cultural how to phrase this you're much better at phrasing my own questions than i am i know uh, what I'm trying to say here is, you know, is it easier in some parts of the world to get parties to use mediation or non-adversarial procedures than other parts of the world? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I would say it's a mix of both. I'm sorry not to give a you know clear-cut answer to that, but it is a mix of both. So I can say from experience that international arbitration in, in the construction industry is, is booming in the Middle East. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, but there are complexities in terms of the various jurisdictions, etc., as well. Um, but like I said before, is we always offer mediation to the parties and remind them now is a stage where actually it would be a good time to attempt settlement. And quite often the parties will try that at least by form of a letter or email to get the other side engaged. Laura, thank you for now. That, that's really useful. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'm going to swiftly move on to, to Helen. Um, Helen, uh, if you could uh, perhaps introduce yourself for uh, 30 seconds and um, let's have a conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, morning or afternoon, depending where you are. Um, my name is Helen Colley. I'm a technical director with HK in London. Um, I'm a structural engineer and I run the structures group within our forensic technical services group, um, which supplies expert advisory and opinion um, to um, parties either prior to or during a construction dispute as they need it. So um, obviously I provide <coughs> structural engineering opinion um, and I have a team of uh, structural and civil engineers. We also have MEP architecture um, and other specialist technical disciplines. We, uh, is anybody else uh, having difficulty hearing Helen's audio? Just, or was it just me? Just you. Well, I, I could hear her perfectly, Martin. Yeah. I'll move my microphone, is that better? There we go. <laughs> Um, a little more like the, traffic the question we're dealing with now here is one that's really close to my heart actually. It's all about, oh, it's now, I think. Yeah. It's all about uh, technology. Yeah. Um, yeah, can and I just before me? I yeah. I can, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. It looks like there was a yeah. little little blip there, but we're we're doing okay. Uh, let's see how we get on. Um we'll, we'll focus in now on technology. And I think you know that part of the theme of the changes um is very much around the, um, the what's happening going forward in the future and we're really interested to hear if you've got any experience in uh, technology having a role in reducing construction disputes. Yeah absolutely and I think the question of whether it has a role in reducing um, construction disputes is, is a little bit leading in the sense that yes it does have a role but it potentially also has a role in increasing them. So I want to talk about both sides of that really. Um, I mean, there is certainly a lot of um, capacity for technology to reduce construction disputes. I think in the situation we're in, particularly with the pandemic, difficult situations breed can breed innovation. Um, like every other industry that's been stuck at home, the construction industry has come up with ways to, to counteract that. 
um, and some of those have been technological. Some are good, some have improved process, but I think we need to be a bit careful about how enthusiastically we embrace them or um, see them as, you know, the solution to uh, the industry's problems. Um, that's particularly true for the construction industry um, because it's a, it's been a steep learning curve, I think. Um, the construction industry is not particularly well renowned for early adoption or its speed to, to innovate. Um, I'm going to repeat a quote that I really enjoy from the former CEO of uh, Multiplex. Um, he said, from a digital and innovation point of view, construction is just one step ahead of farming, which is fairly damning indictment of his own industry, really. Um, I'm not sure that that's entirely fair, um, but because the construction industry is so huge, it can be difficult to implement technological change. Um, the COVID has been a catalyst for digitalization, um, but I almost wonder if it's come around a little bit too fast in terms of we've been forced into it. And you know, when you're forced into reliance on something, particularly in a virtual environment, um, does that mean uh, you know that's potentially problematic in terms of you're reliant on something and not actually 100% um, up to speed and using? Um, so, so that's where I, I see the problem is just inexperience. And and as speaking as an engineer, that's that's one of the biggest problems in the industry generally. Anyway, is a skills shortage. And um, you know, do we have the necessary people to be using technology in the way that we are? Um, but to talk more specifics, I mean, BIM is the obvious one, has an incredible capacity to reduce disputes because in short, it, you know, a BIM model allows you to test ideas quickly and efficiently. Class, detec class detection is a really obvious win. Um, until BIM came along, we couldn't, you know, you had to sit and do that manually and now you can do it automatically. You can make better changes, you can make more efficient designs quicker and uh, cheaper. Um, digital twin technology, I can't say that I'm an expert on it, but it, from the reading that I've done, the research that I've done, it promises to be extremely effective in identifying potential problems several years down the line, which which I see a lot of in, in structures, civils and structures, of problems to do with maintenance, whether the maintenance strategy was correct, whether it was correct but didn't work because it was untested, things like that. We can test things out in advance with digital twin technology and that, that promises to be incredibly powerful. Um, so I think those are um, those are the really obvious ones. And then yeah, on the Helen. physical side, yeah, sorry. No, you carry on and I'll, I'll come in in a moment. It was just that on the last point, I want to touch on physical technology. So, for example, drones and, um, well, AI is not really a physical technology, but I'm talking about it in the sense of using, um, it's not AI, AR, sorry, augmented reality on site, which is being trialled, I know, at the minute, or in fact used, I think, um, possibly Mace or someone have, bit, have used it very successfully recently on walking around a site. And obviously that's enabled things to go ahead during a pandemic. So that it kind of brings a continuity aspect that we didn't previously had when a site was shut it was shut when something was unsafe it was unsafe now we have these technologies to to keep things going um but again i'm going to be the voice of doom and gloom is you know i do have concerns about whether virtual site knowledge is any replacement for solid site experience people have been working on sites for 20 years they know exactly what to look for a drone does not um, and a drone operator is not the same as an experienced site operative. So again, I think it, the role of technology is down to how we use it and whether we use it well. Um, and part of the problem we have is, is the skills gap at the moment in being able to do that, I think. Thank you very much, Helen. I'm going to ask for you for a view in a moment, but uh, I'll ask the others if they might join in as well with this one. Um, not so long ago, I attended a, a, a conference of uh, rural charter surveyors, and uh, I was absolutely astounded by the way they had embraced technology. Not the thing you would have expected, I know, from um, uh, rural practitioners. So it was very interesting to hear you suggest that you know uh, the, the construction industry is perhaps even behind the rural side in terms of its embracing of technology. But why do you think? Um, the industry has been a, and is slow in embracing technology? Well, I think uh, part of it, like I said, I think is the size, the size and scale of things that we're doing generally 
um, is almost a shot in the foot. So anything that is quite small and we would be a prime perfect thing to try out a technology on or get up to speed with it is too small to justify the cost of the additional technology. Anything bigger and the risk is too high to put something into practice that isn't used. So you, we learn as an industry and again it's it's about collaboration. I think there's been a lack of collaboration where if everyone joined mm. together decided we're going to implement BIM, BIM and there have been efforts to do that but if we all decide we're going to implement BIM we're going to use it for everything we should share best practice we should share how we do things that would maybe encourage adoption of technology onto bigger projects whereas because that information isn't available the tendency for project managers or for, for engineers practicing engineers is to do the same thing they've always done and that's something in construction that I'm sure everyone here has seen is, well, this is how we've always done it. And that's, you know, it's, it works, but it doesn't always lead to the best result, but it's at least predictable. Um, whereas the outcome with using new technology is unpredictable and, and um, construction doesn't like unpredictability because you're spending a lot of money and you want you want a fixed result at the end. I, I hear what you're saying. I, I... I've had a, a glance through the uh, the Crooks report and I'm looking again at the slides that um, HK have produced today and there is this um, message that comes across that uh, technology does have a role to play going forward in reducing disputes and it's very interesting in terms of some of the examples that uh, are uh, given by HKA in its report and I think, um, I don't know Charles if you might want to come in on this, that there is perhaps going forward as part of this changing culture, this whole change that's happening throughout the industry, that the speeding up of, if you like, progression might include greater use of technology as a means to kind of help address disputes much earlier, either through better information. You know, uh, Ellen's talked about BIM, talked about having better data, more information, sharing that information. That is that the you know when I, when I give talks about dispute resolution I often say that at the heart of many disputes is a lack of information you know parties position themselves based on what they know what they think they know but with more technology more information uh, there could be the potential for a reduction in disputes going forward uh, yeah I, I think you're absolutely correct um, you know th this idea that uh, a greater level of information, as long as it's the right information, as long as it's accurate information, um, and as long as it's um, it can be identified, utilised, and analysed and applied by both sides equally, then then you know knowledge is power, isn't it? As they say. So um, the more information there is out there, hopefully the less difference between the parties there there will be. You know, you you've probably been involved. I'm sure Laura has um I'm sure you have a comment on this in respect of you know the first issue you need to get up with an dispute or dispute really is, is the kind of the understanding of the facts uh and if the parties can't even get uh, aligned on what the facts are then you know often things spiral out of control even more so you know this idea of the information movement not not just in looking at um uh, you know dealing with risk and dealing with past instances but also looking at the facts of the case and I think the information flow should assist that. I don't know Laura if you've got thoughts on that. Well um, all I can say is that in my view obstacles are always an opportunity for evolution and so communication is absolutely essential and I think that innovation and, and um, technology can accelerate that and make it more accessible, make it more precise. So uh, I'm not sure to what extent technology can help us reduce the number of disputes, but what I can say that during disputes it can be immensely helpful. Thank you, Laura. And certainly, I'd encourage anybody who hasn't yet read it to have a look at the report and what it talk, says about technology and how its introduction can have an impact on uh, conflicts and disputes, and mainly around that kind of sharing of information and. Um, uh, and, and knowledge. Um, to all my speakers, I'd like to say thank you very much. Is, is there anything that anybody wants to ask, uh, either from the audience or indeed um, any of our speakers want to add to what's been discussed as well? Come, 
I'd like to come in on the technology point and why Please do. Uh, our sector hasn't taken it up. And I agree with what Helen said, um, but I would add to that also. I think the reason that the not the not robots and things like that, I think one of the reasons that hasn't happened is because everything we build is different. Yeah, so we don't, we're not building one mini and then replicating it a million times, but the yeah. automotive auto sector does. The, the, I think the problem we've got is around standards. So we do everything different. We ran a round table at RICS five years ago, and we got all of the software people in the room and had dinner at HQ. They don't talk to each other. They all operate in silos. Yeah, there's no yeah. like group that gets them together. And um, I thought RICS might be able to do that, but we didn't. I think we missed a trick there. So they don't have a standard way of approaching it. I think now we do have an opportunity because now we've got um, ICMS3, so that's cost, life cycle, and carbon all being report, reported in the same way, and the software companies are going to take that up. So I think you've got a chance then of, of some disruption. It would be interesting to see on the, the Autodesk side, Revit and the like, if, if what they're doing, if they are now talking to other people so that these models are transferable. I think in summing up, we've only got a few minutes left. It, it, it seems to me that what the report, the Crooks report has highlighted is this, as it's described, eye-watering effect of disputes right across the construction engineering industry. And that this is real, this is happening now. And it's also historic. You know, this is something that's been around for a long time. What it also comes across is there's an appetite and actually actions that are happening that are helping to address and change the culture of the industry. Um, you know, Charles, you, you, your uh, explanation of what's happening as a result of COVID, you know, the short, long term, the massive amount of impact that's happening in terms of moving forward and making people think there's a lot of good that can come out of that. And I think part of that can be people starting to think the future that we really do need to change the industry so that it is much more able to grapple conflicts and disputes before they even happen at an early stage and certainly as they start to emerge rather than it's far too late. Uh, Justin's given a sort of a real world example of you know it's this is happening the disputes are are, are now be on the increase and they have been for a while but also that the nature of those disputes has changed you know in terms of the, the what parties are arguing about uh, and that's kind of very interesting. It certainly come across in at least one of the conference I've attended. Uh, and Laura, you know, the, the appetite, particularly internationally, for the use of arbitration uh, and parties getting good advice to, um, you know, to make the best of a process like arbitration. But uh, this uh, increase in use of a process like that can only be for the good. Uh, if it just at least gives parties the opportunity to have certainty, but also a cost-effective way of resolving the disputes, whereby they get a decision made ultimately by somebody who understands the dispute, understands the nature of the beast that they're dealing with. Um, Helen, this uh, uh, whole subject of technology, I think, is one that's going to be on our radar for a long time to come. And it's, I think, going to be the future that there is a, 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 a movement. I talked at a recent conference about how adjudication, for example, which is something that's been used widely to resolve disputes in the UK construction industry for nearly 30 years, has evolved over a long period of time. But within the last 12, 18, 20 months, it has taken a huge leap forward. And part of that is because of technology. I was listening to a highly experienced uh, adjudicator talking about how he need, uses technology now to adjudicate, whereas two years ago he wasn't. And I think it's there and it's it's the future going forward. Um, I'd like to just thank all of you for the time that you've uh, given to today to, uh, to join this. I think it's been an interesting and valuable discussion. I hope the audience have enjoyed it too. Uh, Daniel, do we have another slide just to, to kind of settle things off here. Um, we will publish a recording and a written summary of this webinar. I hope you, you take advantage of that. And please take a few moments to uh, share your thoughts on this webinar using the online poll, which will appear on your screens um, after the, the event is uh, finished. And please also join us for another webinar in the future. Um, 
go to the website for further details. And you can also, on that website, of course, uh, watch previous uh, webinars. Danielle? Uh, yeah, this is uh, the World Built Environment Forum uh, Global Summit will be um, uh, used, set in Dubai as part of the Expo 2020 uh, event in uh, January 2022. Uh, I, I can hear you saying what's the 2020 event doing happening in 2022, but of course we all know the reason for that. That's why we've, we've been having our chat today. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. It just remains for me just once more to say um, you can download this uh, uh, webinar and to say thank you very much. And you can also download the web F, uh, from the App Store or Google Play. Uh, so I think all those formalities are out of the way. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. <laughs>